to read from Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. I'll start with Exodus chapter 3, verse 12. And I will take it from the Amplified Version, if you permit me. And it says, And God said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve and worship God at this mountain. Certainly I will be with you. Certainly I will be with you. And that is how the Lord is sending us forth this morning, first of all. That certainly he will be with us. Because when he calls us out, he is with us. And this part of the Bible is one of the first parts where we see people being called out. Being called out of bondages. Being called out of places where they found themselves. Which is not necessarily their making. But might have come because they were just looking for their daily bread. Or they might have been there because they came from a certain region. Or because they came from a certain family. And God says there is much more. And for someone this morning, the Lord is saying there is much more. And as he's saying that, he's saying, certainly, I will be with you. And the last part says, you shall serve and worship God at this mountain. I was looking for a scripture to add service to it. Because the title of the message this morning is Work and Worship. Work and worship. Because most times, we feel that what God wants alone is for us to worship. And the moment we hear worship, we turn our attention to the choir. And then when we leave the choir, we look for the next music minister. And then when we leave that, we look for that beat that sounds good to us in our ears. But this verse... Or this version or interpretation of the Bible reminds us that it is to serve and worship. And that's why I titled this message, Work and Worship. Because several times in life, we are tied down by work. Work can be service in God's house. It can be ushering as we see, joining the choir, helping out in administration, that could be a form of work. And indeed, this is reminding us that for those of us who are there, God has called us out to be there. And it might also be a form of service to others. Some of us, or most of us, have responsibilities towards our families. You have to be out there. I bet some people are not in church today and not online because they have to be in the office because their job makes them work on Sundays. Or they have a certain deadline that they need to catch. And then they find themselves just stuck in that work. And it is a form of service and a form of worship as well. It is one of the things God has called us to do. But we now need to get to that stage where we realize that what is the work and what is the worship. And we see how we merge both of them together and make our work a worship lifestyle. So that when you are standing, but you are not singing, you can consider yourself worshiping God. And when you come and you say, oh, I'm not active in the house, the same Bible says, do not forsake the assembly, the gathering of the brethren. You know that your coming here is already a form of worship. And why am I saying it's a form of worship? Because God accepts it as well. And I'm going somewhere. I'd like to take us to Luke chapter 10 from verse 25 to 27. And I'm saying this because most times... We judge others and we judge ourselves as well. And when we do that, it stops us from getting into the crux of the matter. 
Because at that point in time, we feel some kind of guilt. A typical example, you are working very hard to maybe pay fees of the children. But at the same time, there is some time that is taking off serving in the house of the Lord. What do we do? We feel guilty, some of us at least. But at the same time, what God looks at is your heart. To know genuinely when you need to be there, to know genuinely when you need to provide for people, and knows that at this point in time, you are just leaving everything and you can sit down and have pure worship. Luke 10, 25 says, a certain lawyer stood up to test him, saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? You know, one thing is this. One of the most difficult people to argue with are lawyers. They know the law. They eat the law. They digest the law. And they make the law. So arguing with them sometimes is pointless because they will just take you around in circles and possibly make a lot of money from it. I'm not looking at any lawyer. And he replied, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. I want to underline with all your strength and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this habitually and you will live. But he, wishing to justify and vindicate, vindicate himself, very good lawyer, asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's supposed to be a very, very easy question. Who is my neighbor? Just look to your left and to your right. That's your neighbor. And Jesus answered him with this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he went there away, leaving him half dead. He, sorry, he encountered robbers who stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went their way, leaving him half dead. Now, by coincidence, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also came down to the place and saw him and passed by on the other side. So, which means that if there are some people we hold to higher standards than ourselves because we judge ourselves, Jesus was using this as an example to show that, look, I look at the heart. It doesn't matter if it's a priest or a Levite who we know as the worshippers. But a Samaritan who was traveling came upon him, and when he saw him, he was deeply moved with compassion and went to him and bandaged him up with wood, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own pack animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two days' wages and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I return. Which of these three do you think proved himself a neighbor to the man who encountered the robbers? He answered, the one who showed compassion and mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and constantly do the same. The one who showed compassion and mercy. For some of us, it is from a place of compassion and mercy that we serve in God's house. For some of us, it's from a place of compassion and mercy that we provide for our families. For some of us, it's from a place of compassion and mercy that we reach out to orphanages around us. Whatever category you find yourself in, you are in a higher place of worship. And I will go to the anchor scripture of today, which is taken from Luke chapter 10, from verse 38 to 42. Luke chapter 10, from verse 38 to 42. And now I'll switch to the NKJV. Now it happened that as, as, as they went, that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And I'll pause a bit over here. Therefore, tell her to help me. 
A lot of these things that we do, they matter. It's not like they don't matter. And while I was using the story of Martha and Mary, is that most times we judge Martha without even thinking of her life, of who she was, and the fact that Jesus loved her. Verse 38, which was the first time we, I mean, we would encounter Martha in the Bible. Jesus was coming from, was taking a journey between Galilee and Jerusalem. Probably going to take him about four days. They were probably tired, probably had dusty feet, probably they had not gotten good food. But out of compassion and mercy, Jesus was invited into the house. Now, Martha was the one that invited Jesus. Now, if our friends are coming into our house, at the minimum, we will arrange the house. If our close friends are coming into the house, who maybe have access to our bedroom, we will arrange the bedroom. If the governor is coming to your house, you probably paint your house and paint the streets. Jesus is coming into the house. And then what happened? Martha got stuck in her work. And it's also a form of worship. Maybe not the highest form, but it's also a form of worship. And what was probably going through her mind was, let me hurry up and get all of these things arranged, organized, so that we can serve the Messiah and give him a reception that is worthy of him. And indeed, it was more or less their culture, the way they welcome people. And that's because that was the acceptable form of welcome in those days. And she did the best that she could. And in every family, when an event happens, or an occasion happens, there is always that sibling who is the one that runs around. And there is the other one who is the one that sits back and is maybe entertaining the guest. And we can look at it from another perspective. If you visit a friend and the friend makes a very, very good meal and says, take, eat, but does not spend time with you, and then you leave the friend's house, that's not a visit. Because the friend is like, I want to have this relationship with you. And as we go on, we'll see that one of the things Jesus was trying to point out here to Martha is that even in that work, I want to have that relationship with you. Because we would always get stuck in the work. And most times, we try to separate the work we do from the relationship we have with God, even if you are serving in God's house. It's not easy serving in God's house as well. Sometimes you are working, but you do things that people may not like. You might tell people to sit in a certain place, but before they left the house in the morning, they had seen themselves sitting in another section of the church. And you're just doing your job as an usher. And of course, when you ask them to move, they give you that look. And you accept it. So it's not easy as well. Or you come from a point of administration and everybody feels like, well, you should be serving me. And we take it. But service is an act of worship. And I would like us to move to another dimension. Martha was the one that invited Jesus to the house. A lot of us are in a place of work where we are so choked up in it, in a place of service that is taking a toll on us, that we are looking at how will I care for this person or that person, how will I think for this person or that person, even when you don't want to, the phone calls will come and say, can you help with this situation? And then we are stuck in it. And it's time for us to invite Jesus into that house. That house of compassion and mercy that is built inside each and every one of us. And we may look at it that 
you know, this is a place where everything seems to be under control. But most times when they take that function away from us, we can't function. They tell some people if you take them away from what they've been doing for 20, 30, 40 years, they cannot function. Because the fact that they are working does not mean, and they are working and smiling, does not mean it's not eating them up on the inside. They tell you leave a nine to five and start a business. What they don't tell you is that when you start your business, your business is no longer nine to five. It's night to whenever you go to bed. So when everybody goes home at five o'clock, you have to remain there and ensure that you can pay salaries at the end of the month. And of course, when you enjoy the profit, you enjoy it as well. And when we find ourselves, when everything seems to be fine, those calls, they reset us. I call them the calls of life. For example, you take a loan from the bank. The moment the account officer calls you even to say hello, what happens? It resets you. My generation will say it resets your brain. Or you are waiting for a call from the doctor and the report comes. As you are trying to download the report in your email, maybe it's just going to take 10 seconds. That 10 seconds will feel like 10 minutes because we get into that mode of reset. And the Lord is saying this morning that that place where you find yourself, I want us to be there together. It is not for you to run in that race alone. And that's why when he was calling the children of Israel out at the onset, when we read Exodus chapter 3, the first assurance was, certainly I will be with you. So where we find ourselves walking, he says, certainly he will be with you. The world tells us whatever you find yourself doing, do it well. The Bible is clearer. It says whatever you, your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And when you get tired, the difference with us as children of God is we know that we have a greater covenant. And when that covenant speaks to us is when we are weak, he is strong. So where our strength fails us, his right hand is going to uphold us. And God will always move you from that place of work to worship. In such a way that you are in a place of work and worship at the same time. And we'll look at the second part of Luke chapter 10 together. If we take it from... Verse 40 again, Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. If she didn't desire to sit at the feet of Jesus, she wouldn't have gone to meet him to say, do you not care? What she would have simply done was to leave everything and go there as well. But you see, Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, 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 Martha. You know, there is one thing about the traits of God in the Bible. When people's names are called twice, it means there is a great thing that is about to happen in their lives. And I will just give a typical analogy. David said, once have you spoken, twice have I heard. But this time around, Martha is being called two times. And we have several people that when the Lord was going to call them, he called them their names two times. One of them is Jacob. Jacob is also someone who was lost in his work at some point. Lost in service. Lost in service for so long that when it was time to go back home, he wasn't sure of how he would go back home. He wasn't sure of how he would get back to that place. And we see what he did in the Bible. He knew he had, he had, he, he had taken the bet right from his brother. He knew he had stolen it. He knew he had taken it in such a way that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the best of ways to have done that. And he ran for his life. And his brother was begging his dad, isn't there any blessing left? Just one little blessing. If there is nothing, at least say that maybe I bless you the clothes I'm wearing, I'll give to you when I pass on. 
And the man said, no. Every single thing is going to the firstborn. And I just pray for every firstborn in the house, for everybody who is carrying a lot of responsibility, that the Lord will call you twice and give you a place of replenishment and reward you a hundredfold, a thousandfold. Because when people carry these responsibilities, we don't know what it feels like for someone to work 30 days in a month. And when the salary comes, you are serving the needs of others. Or you're at home, and then everything goes out. Someone sent something to me this week. He said, While we're, whilst we're growing up, we knew the last day of the month was payday, but never understood by our parents who say they don't have money on the last day of the month. We've all been praying for that last day of the month. And then you ask for something on the last day of the month, and they tell you there is no money. Enormous sacrifice. And Jacob did something. He first of all sent sheep cows, goats. Maybe this will appease my brother. And his brother said, I don't need any of this because the Lord had replenished him. And then he felt maybe that was not enough. He sent his servants. He sent his wives. The wife he loved less, go forward. The one he loved more, next. And then he came. And the Lord was saying, all this work, all this strategy, I have moved beyond that. And for Esau, who thought he had lost everything, the Lord showed him that man's blessings cannot limit my blessing. And if there is anyone in the house who has been looking forward to somebody blessing you for something, the Lord will surprise you. He will surpass your expectations. His word says the expectations of the righteous shall not be cut short. And I'm declaring that this morning. I love saying that every Sunday morning. That as they have seen it happen, the Lord is saying I'm going to see it in a new dimension. He's saying that the plans he has for you is to give you a future and a hope. So when you feel that everything is not going to work out here, the Lord is saying doors will be opened unto you. The Lord is saying men may have disappointed you in the pastor and you've looked that you cannot even cry unto any man. He's saying he's going to send angels coming your way. They are going, he's going to use them to open doors for you. You've been working very hard. You've been sowing in a particular place. The Lord is saying this morning that that field, that field is about to ripe. You see, Martha invited Jesus into the house and she was working. But when Jesus came, Jesus came now and the blessing started to open. And I, was, and I know why I'm saying the blessing is there to open because earlier on I said we're going to move from walking to worship. At the point when they were waiting on Jesus, when Lazarus passed on, and Jesus first of all told his disciples that this is because the Son of Man is to be glorified. By the time Jesus got to their house, the first person that met him was Martha. Some people have said maybe she was trying to manipulate him by saying, no, if you're here, this will not happen. No. At that point in time, she had probably seen that meeting with Jesus and serving in the house is also part of worship. And she was the first person to meet with him. And she was the first person to remind him that I know you can do this. She was the first person to start those faith conversations. She was the one that went back home and called her sister. I say it is time for you to be strengthened. It is time for you to be comforted. This was the same matter that at some point he felt like she couldn't be at Jesus' feet. But he met her in her house. He met her in that place. And I would like us to just invite Jesus into that house this morning. We are the ones that know that place which takes a toll on us which is weighing us down, which might seem like, is this a bondage? Which might seem like, why is it that at every certain time, maybe when I'm about to get to a certain place, something draws me back? Which might seem like, why is it that in our family, this is the limit that we have? And you know, we are working so hard to break those limits, to break those bounds. And sometimes when people tell me these things, sometimes I take it for granted. But I look back and I'm like, oh, this person is right. He might say that, oh, in our family, nobody has gone to the university. And you look at it and say, why don't you just take jam and go? And you see that this person is struggling, but he's excelling in other areas. And it is time for us to invite Jesus into those other areas. 
it is time for us to say that, Lord, I've done this on my own. I want to sit at your feet with this. Because I want to move to that level where the work and the work of my hands are all entangled and it's a form of worship unto you.